Good morning, everybody, and Shabbat Shalom, a good Sabbath to all. This is, well, I don't even know how to say that. There are certain portions, certain sections of the Torah that are uh, soaring heights, uh, mountaintop experiences, uh, transformational uh, words, and this is one of those. I mean, we, we saw it in Parsha Lech Lecha in Genesis, whenever the first call of Abraham and the definition of what Abraham's call and the covenant was to be like. Lech Lecha was one of these first mountaintop Parshas, and then we got uh, further, and we, we, we got into, uh, well, well, we got into to particularly in, in Parsha uh, Beshalach, we got the release of the oh, hallelujah. We the re, last week's the release of the prayer of the praise of the adoration of the frequency of heaven coming to earth. That was one of the mountaintop experiences at the Sea of Reeds. And then to this week, it's it's Parsha Yitro, the 17th of the segments or the portions of the Torah, uh, beginning with chapter 18 of, of, of Exodus and going through uh, chapter uh, 20. Uh, of Exodus, those those chapters right there. Now we're going to see a, a few others uh, in this process. We're going to see uh, in Parsh in in Book of Leviticus, we're going to have one of these mountaintop parshas. It's Parsha Kedoshim, Kedoshim, the Holy Ones. That's in uh, the 19, the love chapter, the 18, 19, 20 realm of of Leviticus. And then we'll see uh, another one, and we'll be seeing uh, Alotka in part in Book of Numbers when we actually leave Sinai. And we actually begin to travel off into the wilderness with the presence of the Holy One with us. And as he rises uh, and, he, and then he fall, comes down upon us and dwells among his people, that's, that's one of those mountaintops. And then we get into part, the, the book of, of Devarim or Deuteronomy and we'll see another, a couple of them. Va'et Kanan, when we have the Shema, the great Shema, and the declaration of the purpose of us, how we respond to God. And, and then the, the final one that I, I really point to is... Um, is Netzavim, and that's whenever we are all standing before him and renewing our covenant with him. These are the, are the high points. These are the greatest hits of all the greatest hits of the Torah. This is the places where we are touched most heavily. Heaven touches earth most specifically. Well, we're in one of those, and it's an honor. We're in Yitro. We're, uh, this one series of, of, of things that happen from chapter 18 through chapter 20, particularly chapters 19 and 20, change the world. Uh, we are not the same world. This is not the same universe uh, by reason of what happened in chapters 19 and 20 of the book of Exodus. Uh, the sages go off in all sorts of different ways m from the standpoint of trying to get you to understand how valuable and important this is to you. We are at Mount Sinai and at Sinai we are going to have the, what I call the great theophany, the uh, universal, ubiquitous theophany. Every Every human being that has ever been born, every human being that will ever be born, every human being that was alive at the time was present to have, because it was outside of time, it was eternal. And we have all been connected to heaven by virtue of this great theophany, what happened in chapters 19 and 20 of Exodus. And uh, we'll see how it all fits in the greater scheme and the greater plan. But I sit there uh, preparing to, to have this conversation with you and with people across the world. And what an honor it is just to be able to talk about this sequence of, of, of events, this great theophany, this great shift in the atmosphere that has set the world uh, in a different direction than it was going and has the potential to heal and restore and redeem creation as when and to the extent we reconnect with this series of events. Uh, I don't mean to be too mystical to you, but what I do want you to understand is we're about to enter holy ground. This is truly holy ground, and what, how you relate to what happens in these chapters will determine whether or not you are really active and engaged and, and useful in the great plan of redemption for mankind as a species, bloodline by bloodline and household by household, and for the restoration of creation uh, to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom. This is the key to the plan. We'll talk more about that. It's called Yitro. This is a sixth section. We, we give a name. The sages of a old have given names to these chapter divisions. And the, these three chapters are called the Parsha or the section or the episode of Yitro. 
Yitro plays a, uh, a role. He does not play the most important role. He plays a role. The role is to get us to where we can hear the words coming from the creator of the universe. We're the great contrast. If you remember in the book of Deuteronomy when he, he told us, he told, Moshe told everybody why the Holy One had led us in the wilderness for 40 years. He said it was to test you. <laughs> it's almost insulting to our hearts. We feel so insulted we had to deal with 40 years in the wilderness. Just to test or a test? Just so he could test us to see whether we would or would not shema his voice? Whether we would or would not listen to his voice as opposed to listen to the voice of the stranger, the voice of another, the voice of a human, the voice of logic, the voice of reason, the voice of, of intelligence, the voice of intelligentsia, the voice of the elite, the voice of the important, the voice of the human. Which will we listen to? This was the test. There's a reason for the test. So that's why Yitro comes, because it's all part of the test. Who will you listen to? Who will you respond to? Who paints your picture for you? Who designs your world and colors your worldview in this process? Is it man? Is it man's institutions? Is it man's belief systems? Is it man's great ideas? Is it man's knowledge? Is it, is it any of these things? Or, perchance, just on the odd chance, is it the creator of the universe whose voice stirs you in your soul, moves you, changes everything about the way you feel about yourself and the way you feel about the world and the way you interact with other human beings and the way in which you deal with your own self-talk and your own mood and attitude and, and your own priority system. What is it? Is it going to be man and what you're hearing on the news or what you're hearing from the educational system or the med medical s f facilities or the, uh, any of the other institutions of man or is it going to be what moves you, what really stirs you, what directs your focus? Is it going to be the actual words and directions and presence of the Creator? That's why Yitro is so important. Yitro is, as an individual, as a person, is going to be the anti, <laughs> the, the anti-Torah. He is going to be a very intelligent man, a very influential man. He's going to have some good ideas, logical ideas. He's going to have all the knowledge that human beings without God can have. And it's going to sound so good. And it's going to make so much sense. Well, I mean, divide people up by tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands. And, you know, hey, look, and, and, and then have a, have a hierarchy uh, of, of authorities where you, one has to go be doing that for that first, a chain of command. It's, it's, it's just, hey, this is common sense. But God calls us to have something more than common sense. God calls us to have connection to the heavenlies, to sit in the heavenly places with him and to have the mind of Messiah. That is beyond common sense. So how, what are we satisfied with? Common sense? Are we satisfied with good information or good education? Or do we demand? Are we craving? Are we hungering? Are we thirsting for the actual presence and words and guidance and direction of our creator himself? So Yitro, we will begin... I will spend very little time, hopefully, talking about Yitro today. But I do want to introduce him and his name. His name, Yitro, is from the Hebrew verb yatar, which is a fascinating verb. It's what happens, I was, well, I'll give you an example and then we'll talk about what it means. I was driving down the interstate highways of Texas on the way to and from court the other day. And as I'm driving, I'm behind an 18-wheeler, a big lorry, a... Uh, uh, I forget what all nations you call the, the transportation units that carry the big loads. The lorries in England and whatever. But, uh, but I was behind him, and he was a, it was a flatbed. So it had a flatbed truck, and it had something heavy on it, and it was strapped down with uh, cloth stripes, straps and some, uh, I don't know what kind of, they were, they were tough. They were big, big cloth straps. But as I'm driving behind him, I'm coming behind him, I notice that this huge heavy load, which is, held down with many straps, has one strap that is just flapping in the breeze. He's flying along at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> and as he's flying along at 75 miles an hour, this, this big wide cloth stripe, this big bond, this cord that is supposed to tie to something is flapping loose in the air. I mean, if it, uh, it would be dangerous. And so uh, fortunately he did realize it was happening and he pulled off the road. 
But his name means yatar, a cord dangling. <laughs> a dangling rope that is not attached to anything. <laughs> yatar, yitro. Yitro is a dangling cord that's not attached to anything. I mean, he's good, he's solid, he's substantial, but he's not attached. He doesn't have the, the attachment to the fullness of the life force in the revelation stream. So his stuff is real, and it looks good, and it, it could be valuable in certain contexts, but it's not strapped down, <laughs> and it's not connected. And so this is the idea of what we're going to get with Yitro. And this is what we get with politicians, and this is what we get with governments. This is what we get with educational institutions and medical institutions and, and uh, every entertainment realm. They're, they're there. They seem to have some validity to them. They're flapping in the breeze, but they're not tied down. <laughs> they're not connected to the eternal. They're not anchored in the, in the wholeness and the wellness and the goodness and all the blessings of the Holy One. So Yitro, I understand who he is. And so he's introduced to us. He comes first, he comes, and then the Holy One will speak, and we're going to talk most about what the Holy One says and who the Holy One is and what he's done. But just for a second, Yitro comes, and he tells us that he's two things. He's Koten Moshe. He is the son-in-law of Moshe. So he comes in that capacity with that hat on. He comes, he's heard something, so he comes with a, with the hat of being the Choten Moshe. But he's got another hat on. He has, all, every human being has another hat on. And the other hat is he is the, uh, he is Kohen Midian. He is the sheik. He is the prince. He is the, the leader of the people of Midian. So he comes not just as Moshe's father-in-law, which we would be sentimental for. And we would, he's, he was his mentor. and we, we, He'd be a good guy. But he comes with another, every, every human being, and that's why we don't trust institutions. And that's why we don't trust all the other things that we deal with here and human beings in this process because they've all got multiple hats. And that means they have multiple allegiances. And that means they are conflicted and what they say can only be taken in light of what it is, which is a mixed bag, sometimes of wisdom, sometimes of folly, sometimes of self-interest, sometimes in, in ethnic interest or social interest or ideological interest and so if you realize this is what you're dealing with you now know how to face Yitro you take from him that which is connected but most of it is not and so you let it go Yitro Yitro will do a couple things the first thing he will do is uh, he will introduce into the camp for the first time animal sacrifice the Holy One won't do it Yitro will do it this is, this is what the nations do. The, an animal sacrifice and what we're going to be told about and what we're going to be taught in the system of the tabernacle are totally different things. Animal sacrifice is a thing that a human being does to justify himself in front of God or the gods or this God or that God, as the case may be. So he's going to bring, and he's going to bring two things, Olaot, and he's going to bring uh, Zevakim. He's going to bring uh, these two facets, but he's not going to do it according to any protocol that the Holy One has given. That will re remain for Parshas that follow, particularly in the book of Le Le Vaikra. We don't, haven't got those protocols yet, so what's going to happen is Yitro is going to bring in something that looks good, that attracts attention, that draws a crowd that seems real, sentimental and spiritual and, and like we are, we are do accomplishing something with doing it, but it is not according to the plan of the Holy One. And it's voluntary. It's done on, solely on the basis of what man has decided is good and what pagan man particularly has decided is good. The second thing he's going to do is going to, to give us an organizational model. He said, your organization system stinks. <laughs> this idea of the creator of the universe Shining through one man and revealing in this season to all other men through the light of this one man, that's not good. That's just lotov. And therefore, what you need to do is you just need to, to divide this up into groups and, 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 and organize it better. And you need to do it in such a way that, that you take the pressure off of any one man because he has no clue. He has no clue who's actually doing the work here. <laughs> he thinks Moses is doing the work. He thinks this is about Moses' energy and, and all the stuff he's doing. It's not about him at all. He doesn't understand that. He has no way of knowing that. Yitro, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that what we have is an empowerment. Heaven has touched earth. And in our human flesh, now it is not us doing the work. 
It was not Moshe doing the work. It was the Holy One doing the work, just using his mind and body and hands to do it with. And so Yitro was, Moshe wasn't complaining. He wasn't tired, and he wasn't going to get tired. But Yitro sees things through the eyes of men. Well, this isn't a good idea. And the other thing that you'll learn from the voice of the, of the another, the voice of humankind, is they always see what's wrong, never what's right. They always see what's wrong. They have a critical eye. The critical eye always points out, what's, that's not right, that's not good. And therefore, you know, you've got the voice of another. They always speak to your flesh and to the limitations of men's flesh. And that's why it's common sense, because com human beings have limitations. The problem with common sense is it denies the supernatural. <laughs> it denies the powerful, eternal, infinite, immortal things of the creator of the universe. It denies the unseen in favor of the seen. And Shaul seemed to say to us, as he, the prophets did, and as the Torah does, we live by emunah. We don't live by sight. We don't live by the seen. We live by the unseen. Hell, this is the secret of how we learn the difference between the voice of another, the voice of the stranger, and the voice of the bridegroom king, the voice of our creator who is the source of all of our hope. Well, we are in a season of, I call it stewarding kingdom kedusha. Kedusha is a Hebrew word, and I don't want to overload you with that if you're not used to it. But kedusha means, we translate it often as holiness. Holiness as an energy, not as a, as a, as a concept, abstract. It is an energy, pulsing energy from heaven. Heaven has an energy to it, the, the throne room. The, the, the heavens, the, the realm, the, the heavenlies, they have an energy pulsing. And Kedusha is not sense of being better than other people or more pure than other people. It is about receiving, embracing, and emitting that energy from heaven. That's Kedusha. So now we are called the steward to be good stewards of, to take and embrace and yield to and then begin to flow in the Kedusha energy of heaven. In other words, the same energy that, that, that energizes the four living creatures. <laughs> holy, 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 Kedush, Kedush, Kedush. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It energizes the elders to, to continually cast down their crowns and fall on their faces before the Holy One. This is the, the energy. This is the energy of Kedusha. And so we are called to embrace and begin to flow in the energy of Kedusha. Now here's the key. The secret that you know, Yitro could never understand. As smart as he was, <laughs> intelligent as he was, he couldn't understand this. We do not operate according to human limitation. We have a covenant with the creator of the universe that allows his Kedusha energy to come into us. We have a, a relationship with him where heaven can touch earth in our bodies, in our minds to think, in our hearts to feel and emote, in our, in our mouths to speak, in our hands to work, in our feet to carry the actual energy of the Holy One. This is why common sense does not avail in this realm of kingdom uh, administration. So we are to, to receive from the beauty realm of heaven and embrace and emit the, the uh, Kedusha, the energy of heaven. Now we're to do so responsibly. This is an honor. We are the honor guard. You know, you, when you're an honor guard, you march in a certain way. You, you dress in a certain way, and you, you respond. You don't, you, you don't respond to aggravation. You don't respond to stuff other human beings respond to because you're on the honor guard. We're carrying this Kedusha of the Holy One. And this requires us to carry it as responsibly and honorably as we can, honoring the one who gave us this responsibility and this assignment, and without profaning it with our own mindset, with our own ideas, with our own ideologies, with our own politics, with our own concepts, with our own belief system, with our own feelings. We don't, you don't pollute that, that which is Kedusha, with your own thoughts. That's where you get into trouble. <laughs> and so the, you, don't, you don't profane it. And then you don't mix it. You don't admix it. You don't adulterate it 
with the things of the world. You don't adulterate it with, with uh, nations and politics. You don't adulterate it with the uh, entertainment world. You don't in, inter, adulterate it with I any of the religious forms that you see, the institutional forms that you see. You don't adulterate it because if you do, you dilute it. And not only do you dilute it, you pollute it. And then it can't be recognized for what it is at all. And its source becomes you, not the Holy One himself. So last week we touched this idea. We touched Kedusha for the first time. We touched the holiness energy of God for the first time. It happened at the Sea of Reeds. It happened when the sea returned to its place and the Egyptians were smothered, were drowned in the water. And all of a sudden, heaven touched earth, and the sounds that came forth from our lungs and from the tambourine of, of, of Miriam and from the words of our mouth, these words were not earthly words. These were not words of wisdom. These words were not intelligence. These words were not education. Nobody taught us these words. They were spontaneously erupting because heaven touched earth and the energy of Kedusha came into our mouths. And so you saw that the words that came forth were not some nice little tale or song you sung or a chorus you sung off the board. This was actually the spontaneous eruption of heaven's energy given human form and voice. Wow, what an amazing thing. That was just the first foretaste. That was the foretaste we had of receiving, embracing, and emitting kingdom Kedusha. But that was just the beginning. This is what the beautiful thing. Now we're going to take step two. In Parsha Yitro, we take step two. Beyond the ability to hear the frequencies, the sounds, the vibrations, the melodies, the, the harmonies, the vocabulary, the meter, the step, the bars, the melody, all before, beyond that, there is the ability to receive the ten pillars upon which all the kingdom of heaven hangs. Downloaded from heaven. We can't make these. These have to come from heaven. These ten pillars of the kingdom on which the, the tent uh, is hung, the tabernacle, for instance, will be the example of this. We're going to have the ten pillars laid out for us. These are not ten commandments, as you may have supposed. I know we call them that. We've called that on many times. These are actually the ten pillars of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'll talk about that more in a moment, but I want to share you a little story. I like to tell stories, and I like when my children tell me stories, or my grandchildren. I have a six-year-old grandchild named Alita, and last night at Erev Shabbat, we're, she's sitting in my lap, we're talking, and she says, Bata, which is what she calls me. Don't know why, other than her sister did, but at any rate, that's what she calls me, and she says, Bata, how many colors are there in a rainbow? And she has a twinkle in her eye, as she usually does, my granddaughter. So I'm thinking, okay, she's got something she's going to teach me here. <laughs> How many colors are there in a rainbow, Bata? And I said, well, honey, that's not as easy as you, an answer as you may think it is because there are actually six that you actually see, but what are you wanting to tell me? <laughs> she says, oh, there's so many more than six. <laughs> there's so many you can't count. Nobody can count. Every one of those colors is in this rainbow, but you can't all see them all, but they're all there. At all times, all the, all, the, all the colors, all the different shades of blue and all the different shades of green and all the different shades of yellow and all the different shades of purple and all the different shades of red and you know, orange. And they're all there, every one that you could possibly imagine and things you haven't ever seen yet, they're all there in the rainbow. And she's smiling, very happy with herself. And I am smiling because I am very happy with myself too <laughs> and with her. And she's caught it. She, doesn't, she couldn't use the word infinity, unseen. She couldn't, she couldn't use the theological terms that you might approach, but what she has grasped is that the things that you see are a small fraction, a tiny fraction of what's really going on. And that's the beautiful thing about these. How many, how many words, how many pillars of the kingdom are there? Well, that's, let me, uh, that's not as easy as a question to answer as you may think. Why, Bata? <laughs> Because there are an infinite number. Every situation has its own. Every, things that have not even occurred yet, they have a pillar in them, a possible pillar for the tabernacle, a possible pillar for the kingdom of heaven to come to the earth. Now we just have to see how we take these ten main ones and go. The ten things, like the six colors of the rainbow that you see. 
This is so it is with these 10 words that he's given to us. <sighs> so we are going to learn to steward the energy that is emitted by these 10 pillars. I, I, I tr cringe inside now when I think of how I learned that for the first 50 years of my life, I thought these were 10 commandments I needed to obey. And then, as I begin to read the Torah in sequence, year after year after year, as I begin to study in the Hebrew and dig into the beyond the English words, as I begin to really begin to, to, to let this become my life, my whole life, I begin to see this is, these, are, these are not ten commandments to obey. These are ten bursts of, starbursts of energy to be released into the world through your life. That is what they really are. This is a betrothal covenant. So we're going to get these energy, the Kedusha energy re released into our lives of these ten pillars of the kingdom. The, on these ten pillars, and realize there are infinite more, but these ten pillars that we'll begin with, he comes. The creator of the universe comes in like a flood. He comes in with his presence, with his majesty. He comes in with his wisdom, with his understanding. He comes in with his counsel and his might. He comes in with his spirit. He comes in with all of his energy, and he infuses them, and he sits and he rests. But he doesn't just rest. He begins to, to sp send out his energy into the people that he, so he can mature them in the kingdom. Well, that was, that's what we do this week. What, why do I get excited about Parsha Yitro? Why do I feel honored and, and humble just to have the privilege to talk about this? Because if I can just communicate one-tenth of what he's saying to you, you will be absolutely filled with energy from heaven. You will be awakened in places you've been asleep all of your life. You've been, been, been empowered. You'll be energized. You'll be pulled into the vortex of the moving of the spirit of the living God. The breath of the creator and his plan will take you in and absorb you. If I can get one-tenth of the beauty of what he's saying to you in this partial. And the rest of Shemot is going to be filled with more and more. We're, what we're going to see in the rest of Shemot is not only are we going to build, build the pillars, download the energy of the pillars. We're actually going to host the presence of the creator of the universe. We're going to host his persona, his personality. Now, we're not going to be a bunch of people who believe a bunch of stuff. We're going to be a bunch of people who carry the presence of the Holy One with all of his power, and with all of his energy, with all of his goodness, with all of his gentleness, all his characteristics, his attributes. We're going to carry those. We're not going to become them. We're going to carry them and bring them into the world. That's the part of the book of Exodus. All right. Last week, we learned something. At Marah, after we learned how to download and connect with the song, with the sound, the drumbeat of heaven and the beat meter, after we did that, we went to Marah, and that's where the bitter water was. But in the course of dealing with the bitter water and turning it sweet and teaching us that there is always a way to make whatever situation you face, whatever circumstances you deal with, there is a way to inject the tree of life into it, a fragment even, a, a little bit of the tree of life into it, and turn the bitter into sweetness, to turn it into something which is totally unpalatable and un, unacceptable and, and un, unsurvivable into something that is not only palatable but also delightful and give us a place for the song, a place for the great hallelujah. You can sing the hallelujah in any circumstance. That's what the message of Mara was about. You can learn to sing the hallelujah and reflect the energy of the hallelujah of heaven in your world, and that is what brings sweetness into the bitterness of this world. <laughs> uh, most of, your, most of our, our, our news and politics is saying how horrible things are. And the Holy One's saying, you haven't got the energy. <laughs> you haven't got the energy I'm trying to release into you. That's just another vessel through which I'm, supposed to, I'm going to release sweetness. <laughs> every dark situation, every dark circumstance, every, every oppression, every abuse, every un injustice that you see out there is merely another bitter water pool to which I will have you help me inject the tree of life into and turn that bitterness into sweet. Well, if you can't sing hallelujah <laughs> in that, then I don't know where you are. But he gave us, next thing he taught us, he taught us that, he said, if you will, if as when and to the extent, you will do two things. He's going to introduce us to two verbs, 
two aspects of how we connect with this divine energy and how we begin to, to translate it and, and move it and emit it. And the first verb is shema. Tune a, tune, like a tuning fork. You, you will tune your whole being to this sound, to this frequency, to this energy. Tune your frequency, tune your whole being to it. That's just, if you will shema my voice, he says. If, as, when, and to the extent you shema my voice. That was step one. So the first verb, the first key on our part, the first responsibility we have to steward the energy of heaven is to shema his voice. Now that requires us to learn not to shema the voice of another. Not to tune our voice. You know, it's kind of like if you got a radio, old-fashioned radio that had a rotary dial, and you could turn the, change the channel, change the radio station, by just by turning your knob this way, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and you were surfing. I know before internet, we surf radio. And you surf from station to station to find a song that you wanted to hear or a message you want to listen to. We surf the radio. If, as, and when, and to the extent you tune your radio to his frequency and leave it there and keep it there and keep re adjusting it till it's perfectly in modulation if as and when instant you get in frequency with what he is speaking what he is broadcasting into you then certain things will happen we'll talk about that in just a second because there's one more key but are you tuned in now to surf means you're tuning out of one thing to tune into something else if you tune out of the holy one where will you tune what station will you broadcast to the news the politicians, the government stuff going on, uh, social, cultural stuff, the educational system, the entertainment system. You'll tune into anything of man, and you had to tune away your channel from the Holy One to be able to get to that. So he says, I'm going to give you two stations this week. The first station is the other station. It's that other station. It's the Yitro station. It's the best man has to offer, but it's all what man has to offer. So you got, do you want to tune into that? Or would you rather tune into my station, my broadcast? Well, if, you, if as and when and to the extent you shema my voice. Oh, <laughs> the sweetness of his voice. The energy of his voice. I'm surrounded here by friends who I know at some time, multiple times in their life, hopefully, have actually heard, felt, absorbed. Deuteronomy actually says we see the voice. How do you see a voice? It's, it's, it's a spiritual realm. You, you sense the, the form and the substance to it and the power of it. The voice of the Holy One, the, not just the words. We'll get to the words later. I'm talking about the voice itself, the sound. He is your creator. He made you. He was, I think, I picture him humming. <laughs> humming a song, uh, maybe the song of the sea, whenever he was making you, when he was knitting you together in your mother's womb, when he was designing your DNA, when he was designing your, your genome. I, I picture this process. Maybe it's all my imagination. I don't know, but what I'm saying is there is a sound. And it's like when Adam in the, in the Garden of Eden, whew, and he heard the sound of the Holy One coming. In English, it says, in the cool of the day, at the time appointed for breathing, <laughs> at the time appointed for the breath sounds. This, this sound, and, and that's why I tell you, if I can get you, if I get one-tenth of the message and the power of this passage, of this parsha, if I can get one-tenth of this message into you, if I can make you hungry, if I can make you thirst for the sound of his voice, we'll get to the words in a little while. <laughs> that's why I'm not the one who says, go seeking after prophecy. The prophecy is step two. You've got to hear the voice first. <laughs> the voice is what you need to hear. The energy of the voice, the passion of the voice, the, the movement, the, that's your creator's sound. It's like uh, when the mother eh, moves in the room and the baby's awake and the baby hears the sound of mama coming. Something stirs. Everything begins to change inside the baby. Inside the child, and there's, the lips begin to 
to move and, and, and go into a sucking motion. The sense of, you can see it. If you ever walked into a room and the mom walked into the room while you were watching the baby and the baby starts, arm starts getting animated and they start almost jumping in the bed as best as they can, as much as a little baby can do. That, this, they leap within their wombs or actually in their bedroom as the case may be when mother comes. This is the way it should be with the voice of the Holy One. He is real. And it is not the kind of voice that a human being speak because human beings speak so loud you can't often hear the other voice. We have to tune our radio to that voice. But if and as and when and to the extent we tune our station, our radio, to that voice and we get on that frequency of the voice of the king, the creator, and we leave it there and we keep tuning and remodulating it and, and, and ignoring and tuning out all the voices of men and all the negativity that they're throwing at us all the time, the news and the entertainment world and all the educational world, the medical world, and all, all these different realms, philosophy and religion. We tune those things out. We listen for the voice. If, as, and when we do that. Oh, then there's one more thing. <laughs> the other verb I told you about. We told Shema. Now the second verb is Shemar. Very close. Shemar. And Shemar is a Hebrew word which means to uh, sow. It's a, it's a whole threshold it's kind of like the rainbow the word shamar is not one word it's it's every word that goes with it it's like a threshold or a, or a big spectrum of, of meanings and it starts past present future tenses goes through the entire process it starts with cherishing valuing something if you will shamar if you will value if you will prioritize if you'll cherish it and and love it and, and make it dear to you then what will happen? Well, then you begin to cherish it and guard it. You'll protect it. You'll, you'll be very diligent with it. You'll carefully watch over it because it's so precious to you, so valuable to you, shamar. And then as you do so, you will guard it against all things that might uh, uh, adulterate it, that might injure it, that might damage it, and that might limit its effectiveness in you. And that's why shamar becomes the protector, the defender. But it's all these things all at once. It starts with the idea of valuing it. If you will shamar his voice and if you will value cherish and therefore flow through with a nat natural response of cherishing and valuing something what he says his covenant if you will shema his voice and if you will treasure cherish guard protect defend value his covenant his breed in hebrew he says then what will happen is i will make sure you don't get those diseases that i put on the land of egypt because i will be the holy one your healer I will be the source of all of your healing, your health, your wholeness, your wellness. That's a pretty powerful thing. That's what he said last week at Marah. He told, he promised us this week, but the keys were the two conditions. If you will shema my voice, and if you will treasure, cherish, highly value, and prioritize my breach, my covenant. Now, what is a breach? Because we're going to need to know this before we go further. Otherwise, we're going to think of these as commandments, put them in finite English words, and say, thou shalt not this, and thou shalt that. That's what we'll think of it if we, if we're not, if we don't understand breed. What is a breed? <laughs> breed is a Hebrew word from the, from the verb bara, which is where, and the Holy One, bara, <laughs> uh, 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 bara second word in the Torah. <laughs> And he, and he formed, he shaped, he, he, and actually it, the literal word is to take an a instrument and, and inscribe or dig a hole or dig, a, dig a, a rut or a ditch. Make a pathway, blaze a trail. It's all about a way. The covenant is not about a, just an agreement. It's not just about even a relationship. All those are involved. What it is is about a way, a pathway. The Holy One by breed, makes a, a rut or a, a roadway, a pathway on which man can operate. Sets them on a pathway. The idea of it, he's made, the, like on a map, if, well, I used to have paper maps. I know that's hard to believe, but paper maps. And, on, and I was going to make a journey, and I knew I had to take several highways. I would take a, a marker or a highlighter, and I would take that map out, and I would actually trace the passage that I was going to take, the roads that I was going to take to get me from destination, from, uh, from departure point to destination point. Anybody else ever do that? I don't know. But anyway, I used to do that. And therefore, I always had that map to, to look at where, what road I was going to be on. And the road was inscribed. The, the pathway was laid out. That's a covenant. That's a breach. 
when you have a pathway laid out. Now, if you don't understand that, then what you'll think is, see, along the way, there's going to be a sign. For I don't know if I can do this for you guys on camera backwards. It, it's, it's going to be an arrow, and it's going to point that way. That is the, that would be to a, a Western thinker, that is my right turn covenant. I have a covenant with God to make a right turn. But up ahead a little further in the way, <laughs> there's another sign. And that sign has an arrow pointing up and that way. Well, I guess my right turn covenant's over and done with. Because I now have a left turn covenant. I have a new covenant. My new covenant is the left turn covenant. No, it's not. That's just Western nonsense. It's all part of the way. It's all whatever you need to do to get along the inscribed pathway to get where you're going to the destination. It's just right. Some days you make a right turn. Other times you make a left turn. But you follow the directions. And it's all part of one covenant because it's all part of one way. <laughs> ah, that's why we don't, you know, all this, all this theology about, well, this covenant was done away with and this new covenant took its place. No, there's only one way. <laughs> and it's all part of the sequence of events and dealing with situations as they come. And that's what we have in regard to this. So if you will, Shema and Shemar. So the keys are to Shema and Shemar. Shema is voice, Shemar is covenant. Do you value the way he has set for you? Do you tr treasure the fact that he has seen a fit to set a pathway through all the circumstances of your life and your children's lives and your children's children? Does his way, is his way important to you? I'm not talking about his theology. I'm not talking about a belief system. I'm not I'm talking about a religious system. I'm talking about the, the way that he has designed for you to pass through all the trials, tribulations, and difficulties of life. Is that important to you? Do you value that? Do you value the way, the departure points, all the turns along the way, and the way which he's going to bring good in the final destination? Do you, do you value that? Because if you don't, <laughs> you're going to get all theological right here real quick. And you're going to get all yitroed. <laughs> you've got to get all concept about well this is good common sense this makes sense at the moment it will but in the greater scheme of things all you need is the divine energy of the holy one to take you there well these are the keys we learned last week and now the test now the t did you hear me will you shema my voice or will you shema the voice of another will you shema my covenant and my way or will you follow the most convenient things that pe other people are doing, like these animal sacrifices that Yitro offers? Will you do it because other people have done it? Do you do it because it sounds good to your ears or your eyes or makes you feel sentimental inside? Will you do it because, you know, you like it when they play music one way or you raise your hand, you don't raise your hand, you speak in tongues, you don't speak in tongues, you, you talk Torah, you talk about the New Testament? Will you do it because other people are doing it? Or will you follow the way? the way that is charted for you, the way that has been laid out. Ask now, Jeremiah the prophet said. Ask now for the ancient path. Ask now for the, for the road that was set so many, so many generations ago. Ask now for the way. <laughs> not for the deviation that makes me feel good for a few moments. Not for the passageway. So that's where we get to. Let's read. I want to short circuit some of these things and go directly into the readings. We're going to leave Yitro to you. Everybody likes to argue about Yitro. I don't have any clue, any interest in arguing about Yitro. I'm going to tell you what he was here for and what he did and understand he's brilliant in the intellectual human standpoint. And then I'm going to move on to the voice that really matters. We're going to start with chapter 19, okay? Chapter 19 of Exodus. Yitro was in chapter 18. <laughs> if you would stand with me. Uh, if you can stand, if you're on the other side of the camera, I appreciate that. But if you don't have to, you can't just stand in your heart, if you would. For those who are here, please do stand. I want to begin uh, with our prayer that I usually pray. It's actually just a recitation, a declaration, a reminder. Open our eyes, O Holy One, our God. 
that we may see wondrous things in your Torah. For we are but strangers in the earth. <laughs> Do not hide your commandments from us. Our souls cry out for your judgments at all times. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your words. Amen. In chapter, last verse of chapter 18, just for context, says, Then Moshe left his, let his father-in-law depart, Yitro leaves, and he went his way to his own land. Chapter 19, verse 1. In the third moon cycle, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. And so Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moshe went up to God, and the Holy One called out to him from the mountain. Here's the voice. Saying, This is what you are to say to Beit Yaakov, the house of Jacob. And what you are to tell to the children of Israel, B'nai Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagles' wings. And brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if as when and to the extent you will indeed shema my voice. And shamar my covenant, my breach. Then you will become to me a special treasure to me above all people. Though all the earth is mine. And you will become a kingdom of priests, of princes, of royalty. And a holy nation. A nation of Im Infused with holiness. <laughs> These are the words that you are to speak to the children of Israel. So Moshe came and called the elders of the people and laid before them all the words that the Holy One had just spoken to him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Holy One has spoken, we will Asa, we will build. Naase was the cry. Naase. Okay, I'm going to move to chapter 20. Verse 1. And the Holy One spoke all these words, saying, I am the Holy One, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You will have no other gods before my face. You will not make for yourself any image by carving or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is even in the waters of the earth. You will not bow down to them, nor will you serve them. For I, the Holy One, your God, am a zealous, jealous God. And I visit those who have sinned to the third and the fourth, all those who hate me. But I show mercy to the thousandth, to those who love me, who treasure, cherish, shamar my commandments. You are not to take the name of the Holy One, your God, in vain. For the Holy One will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you are to labor and do your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Holy One, your God. In it you are to do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Holy One made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and he rested the seventh day. And therefore the Holy One blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You will honor your father and your mother that your days will be long in the land of which the Holy One your God is giving you. You are not to strike and, and tear apart. You are not to adulterate yourself. You are not to take that which is not given into your hands. You are not to bear witnesses deceiving, deceptive regarding your neighbor. You are not to covet not your neighbor's house, not his wife, not his male servant, 
nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And all the people witnessed and thunderings and lightnings flashing and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled. And they stood afar off. Amen. You can be seated. Wow. <laughs> Energy pulsing from heaven. Not a commandment. Not something you have to obey. It's energy coming to you from heaven. This is the way in which your bridegroom king sees you. This is his betrothal declaration of who you were created to be and designed to be. The, the ten essential characteristics that you are designed to carry into the world that you have to tune out everything else to get to these ten characteristics. And this is who you are going to become. This is the bride of the creator of the universe. This is the bride people, the, the covenant people of the creator of the universe are going to have these characteristics because, you see, they're energized from heaven. And all they need to do is not, not uh, obey them. Quit fighting them. <laughs> Quit resisting the energy that's being placed into you from heaven. Quit being so unbride-like that you just do things on your own. Well... Basically, what we have is a pattern that's going to be laid out. There's going to be one all-encompassing word followed by nine smaller versions of that word. The one and the nine. The one and the nine. The one is, in, in, this, in Exodus chapter 20, the one is who he is. I am the Holy One, your God who brought you, who yatsad you, who, who brought you forth like a seed comes forth from a plant, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That is the crown. That is the, the kether in Hebrew. That's the crown. The crown is who he is. The nine things are who we are. So if we understand who he is and who we are to him and who he is to us, out of that, the other nine things will flow. The energy of the other nine will flow. But if we don't get number one, this is why whenever people in English tradition or Western tradition or Christian tradition recite the Ten Commandments, they leave this out. Because it's all Yitro thought. <laughs> I will have to do these things. I will do these things. This is good common sense. This is a good, good idea to do these things. But no, this is that the whole thing starts with one, the crown that the jewels are in is the golden reality that we come from. All things flow from him, and he is the one who is bringing them forth. He's yacht sighing them. So we have this, this crown of nine, the nine jewels that come in the crown, adding up to ten. What are the nine jewels? Well, we can read it, no other gods, no visible images, uh, Sabbath uh, cherishing, uh, home honoring, uh, parents honoring. Uh, not tearing things apart, not being a, a, a ripper, a, a one that tear things apart, Jack, Jack the Rippers, not being one who adulterates his own uh, life force with things that are not pro appropriate mixtures, not uh, stealing, taking, look, looking for things that don't belong to you, that God has entrusted to other people, thinking that you're entitled to them somehow, uh, not, uh, not uh, bearing witness that, that is a false testimony of who God is and who you are and who you're supposed to be, not bearing false witness, and then not coveting, not desiring, not having you letting your mind and your desires run wild, but instead training them, disciplining them to the desires the Holy One has for you. These are the nine jewels to your crown. This pattern is going to be repeated. This pattern of the of the of the, of the crown, the one truth that overlies it all, and the nine sequences will come again. The crown of crown and nine of nine jewels, I call it. The crown of nine jewels. We'll come back again with Yeshua. Yeshua, whenever he comes and teaches, he will give the crown of nine jewels. He will say, I am the good shepherd. That's the overall arching, the, the crown. The crown is he is the good shepherd. The nine aspects of what that good shepherdness looks like, the nine follow the, the same pattern, the one and the nine. You're going to find out. What does he find? He says, I'm the bread of life. One jewel. Two, I'm the light of the world. I am the, the, uh, the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection in life. I am the, the uh, uh, true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the olive and the tab. I am the one who searches the heart. I am the bright and morning star. These nine attributes are part of this great crown that Yeshua wears. And he had ten crowns on his head, right? 
<laughs> he had ten crowns on his head, the book of Revelation says. What are the ten crowns? There's the basic crown plus all the jewels of the crown that comes forth. He has this same pattern. You say, oh, that's Yeshua. That's that. What about, what about what Peter said? Remember what Peter said? First, second Peter chapter 1. He said, uh, now, well, let's talk first about Paul. Before we get to Peter, let's talk about Paul. Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit, this is the overarching, the crown. The crown is the fruit of the Spirit. What are the, what are the, what are the, the nine jewels in the crown? The fruit of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace, <laughs> long-suffering or patience, goodness, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, emunah, faithfulness, and self-denial or self-control, as it said in some places. Those are the nine jewels in this crown. So we have this pattern. We have it at Sinai. We have it reproduced in Yeshua's teaching. We have it reproduced in the fruit of the Spirit aspect of Paul's teaching. And then we get to... Uh, to Peter's scenario. First, second Peter two, or excuse me, second Peter one, verses two through eight. Remember this, he says, now add to your faith. He says, You you have Yeshua, now add to your faith, add to your emunah. You start adding things. Eleven nine jewels. Add nine jewels to your crown which is your relationship, your salvation, your deliverance, your relationship with all. And he goes through this. He says, what do you add? You add to your, to your amina. You add diligence or earnestness, vigilance. You add, to add that. You add virtue. Or in Hebrew, it would be tehilot, shinings of, of his presence, manifestations of his presence. You add knowledge. Hebrew would be yada. You add self-denial or self-control, uh, humility. You add perseverance and patience. And to that, you add godliness or gravitas or weight of the Holy One. To add that, you add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, you add love. And now you have nine jewels in your crown. That's the same pattern that's been followed ever since Exodus chapter 20. A crown. We have a crown. Now, we are responsible. We are issued this crown. It was given to us at Mount Sinai. It's been reworded, uh, restructured, uh, restrung. Re, redecorated with, the, with these nine jewels multiple times throughout the script, the Holy Script of the, of the Bible. But here we are. We are responsible now for wearing this crown. Uh, anybody ever like, act in a play or uh, a drama or anything like that and had to wear a crown? Maybe a Purim, <laughs> maybe a Purim play. Anything you did. And, and you ever, here's the thing about wearing a crown. It isn't natural. And you have to be careful how you walk. You can't just sling your head around. Because you'll toss your crown off. You have to walk with a little bit of gravitas. With a little bit of balance. You, ha you have a crown on your head. You, you can't just behave any old way when you have a crown on your head. Now this is the key about wearing a crown responsibly. This is the idea of the, the, the nine jewels in this crown. And having the crown itself of being the Holy One being the one who brought us forth out of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. And the nine things that are attached to that, that is part of the crown we are called to wear. We are called to wear it responsibly. And to make sure that every element of it is continually polished and shining and radiating its energy into the world. Every one of those jewels is a critical aspect of bringing the energy of heaven, stewarding the holiness, the kadusha of heaven, and bringing it to bear upon the earth. Everything is part of the way. Everything is part of the great pillars of the hang on which the kingdom of heaven hangs. Wow. Okay, I hope that's got you started here. Let's look at the ten things. Okay. Anochi Adonai Eloheka Asher Hotzet Eteka Me Eretz Mitzrayim Me Bet Avid Avidim. I am the Holy One. I am, I have been, I will always be your God. 
I have brought you. I have yachtsad you forth from the land of Egypt. You owe your very life to me. I am your creator. I am the one who put everything in you that is in you. I am the one who directs all your, I have all rights to you. This is who you are. Do you know who you are? This is divine energy. So I'm, I'm telling you who, what you're on earth for, what your purpose is. You are not here to do your own will. You are not here to accomplish something great in the way of man. You're not here to be the cutest, smartest person in the room. You are here because I have yachtsad you. I have made you. It's like in Yatsa's first use in Hebrew in, in the Bible, in the Torah, is found whenever he say, created the, uh, the plant life on the third day of creation. It's the first thing he yatsa. He calls the, the earth to yatsa, to bring forth, to bring forth trees and shrubs and grasses in which was their seed. So the yatsa means he's bringing forth a life force in you and he brings forth seed in you to reproduce itself over the course of time. So this is who he is to you. This is the aspect. Now, if he is the one who yatsad us, if that is who we really, that changes our entire worldview. It should change our entire worldview. What kind of worldview do you have? And it changes your identity. We live in a world where identity is based upon a number of factors. We identify, we self-identify as a part of an ethnic culture or a racial uh, culture. Uh, or part of a, uh, of a national culture. Or a part of a regional culture. Or a part of an educational system. We are a part of, some, we, we connect ourselves, we divide ourselves is what we do. We divide ourselves according to different ideas of how, uh, we divide ourselves on the basis of ideology. I'm a conservative or I'm a liberal, or I'm a moderate, or I'm an anarchist, or whatever I am, I label myself and I divide myself by that factor. And the Holy One says, see, that's the voice of another talking to you. You think, you identify yourself as any of those things? You have missed the entire point because I, I outside you, and I know who you are, and what you are is a child that I have redeemed. Liberal or conservative, black or or white, or Indian, or Arab, or whatever nationality, or race, or color, skin color, or pigmentation you may have, whatever, whatever region you come from, whatever language you speak, whatever economic class you're part of, whatever sports team you, you think you support, whatever entertainer you like best, whatever form of music you like best, whoever you think you are, let me tell you who you are. All men are like grass. <laughs> All men are like grass. And you, I have brought you forth in the earth at such a time as this to carry my seed. That is the only reason. And you are just, in that regard, you are not separated on the basis of ethnicity. You are not separated on the basis of gender. You're not separated on the basis of class. You're not separated on the basis of education level. You're not separated on any level other than this. You are all here. You are like grass in the growing in the field. And in you is a seed. Do you, this is your world. If this is your worldview, we get over all this racism stuff. We get over all this ethnic, ethnic pride nonsense. We get over all this ideological differences stuff. We get over all this political party partisanship. We get over all this stuff because we are all just grass. We are given our specific part of the field. And in our specific part of the field, we're going to bring forth the seed of what is in us. May his seed be in us and not be GMO seed. has been adulterated and mingle with a bunch of chemical stuff from the world. May we be real seed that brings it forth. So this idea of identity, our identity is tied up in these words. Everything else flows out of our identity. When our identity is as the seed that is in the grass, that is in the field, that is produced by the Holy One, when that becomes it, then we don't argue with each other about stuff. It's, it's irrelevant. It's unimportant. To the contrary, we, we just become who we're created to be. We just begin to speak as we're given to speak. We begin to do what we're created to do. We begin to re radiate joy and energy into people's lives. And we leave the other stuff alone because it's not our call. There's many people, there's many yitros to fight that battle. Those yitros are going to fight that battle no matter what we do. Our job is not to do that. Let, let the yitros fight. Well, that's step one. Step two is that this first crown gives us 
the, our responsibility in every situation. Our responsibility, if we are Yatsad by the Holy One, that's who we are. If that's our identity and that's how he sees us and that's who he is to us, he is the one who Yatsad us. If that's what he is and who we are, then how should we interact with every situation in the world? We need to carry that crown honorably and respectfully. We need to understand the crown, it's all about the crown. For the sake of the crown, we will forego our arguments. We will forego our attitudes. We will forego our moods. We will forego our sense of what's right and what's wrong. We will forego all that for the sake of the crown that we carry. For the mission that we're called to. For the purpose for which we're on earth. Wow, would this change everything. Would this change everything if we just learned to do these things? We said, but, but I can't tell which Yitro would win. It doesn't matter which Yitro wins. Whether the conservative Yitro wins or the liberal Yitro wins. Whether Balaam wins. Whether the argument, whether... Whether uh, any, any of those guys, Balak or Balak, it doesn't matter who the enemy, Laban, doesn't matter who the enemy is, and they win their battle, we still are who we're created to be. We do what we're created to do. We hold our crown responsibly. We wear our crown responsibly. Whew. Now, it also changes what I call our deity paradigm. The paradigm we have of the divine one, the persona of who he is. One of the things that happens in various different movements is they claim a certain name. Uh, pronunciation. It's not even a name. It's just a pronunciation. <sighs> but he said, the way I want you to know who I am is that I yatsad you <laughs> by what I did, what I have done, and what I'm doing. I am I'm causing you to burst forth. It's not, you, if you ever, we learn how to let other people have their own version of their name, of their pronunciation. Let them do it. It is not critical. The important is, are we also, are we yatsad? Are we flowing in the, in the bringing forth of the Holy One, of the making us fruitful, of the making us, are we caught in that? If so, we'll leave all their arguments over what pronunciation to use alone. He didn't say, I am the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He didn't say, I'm El Shaddai. He didn't say, I am your father. I am your king. I am your judge. He didn't use any particular thing like that. He said, I am the one who yatsad you, who brought you forth. And in bringing you forth, I will always be that. Okay, so next thing is, uh, he teaches us what our job is. What is your job? What is your purpose being on earth? To bear fruit. To bring forth seed. And fruit which is in and and fruit in which is your seed. In which is his seed. This is your job. This is job one. So every situation we face, this changes our color. My job is not to set everybody right. Not, our job is not, not to tell everybody what my opinion is. My job is not to to correct all the wrongs in the world. Good luck with that, if that's your sense of your job. Don, Quixote. Hope you hope you do well with your with your windmills and with your sword and with your trusty steed and with your squire, but you ain't going to get very far in that process. Now the issue is, what are you here for? I, in this situation, I'm supposed to bear fruit of the king. Whatever the situation is, my job is not to address it with my ideology or with my politics. My job is to address it with the fruit, the life force of the king to bring fruit out of the situation. Now this changes everything, right? This is the crown that we wear. And the jewels in it begin to unfold one by one after that. Uh, all right. The second thing is, he says, Lo yye lecha Elohim achrim al You will have no other authorities before, between your face and mine. <laughs> I used to use this little illustration to try to explain what this means. Is that whenever I was... Uh, my, my youngest grandchild, granddaughter, Gabriella, was very young. She was a toddler. And at a certain stage in life, I was a lot to her. I still am, but I mean, I was a lot to her. <laughs> and when Gabriella wanted, to, she wanted to sit in my lap or she wanted to walk with me all the time. She wanted to sit in my lap, but she sit in my lap, but she wanted me to look eye to eye. And sometimes I would be having this conversation with her in my lap like this, we're, we're fa nose to nose, beak to beak, eye to eye. She wanted me like that. She wanted, to, she, would, she wanted me to talk to me and see my eyes. She wanted to look me in the eyes. She wanted my, all my eyes, all my attention on her. 
And occasionally someone would speak to me from the other room or from the other chair. And I would turn my face. I would still have her in my lap. I would still hold, she's still my granddaughter. But because Rosemary would call to me from the kitchen, you know, or, or a friend would be there and they would start having conversations about the Torah, I would turn my head and I would still have her right there. And I soon I would feel two little hands. And I would be turned this way and two little hands would reach up. And turn my head fairly gently <laughs> to the point where my eyes were next to her eyes. Her my nose was next to her nose and my, my face was right in front of her face. And that was the way in which Gabby let me know that no other no other gods, no other authorities, no other important things were supposed to be between my eyes and her eyes. This is what the Holy One is says. This is the jewel number one, is that nothing else going on. Nobody else who's making noise, nobody else who is throwing up a big hissy fit about something or saying something very important, nobody else will take our eyes off of him. Jewel in your crown, number one. How are we doing with that? I've seen a lot of political stuff. I've seen a lot of entertainment stuff. I've seen a lot of anger about a lot of things. So I know, <laughs> I know how easy it is to hear the other voices and tune our, turn our heads that away and gently needing to have the Holy One be like Gabby and reach up and turn our face back to, no, look at me. Well, we're going to have to move on. My wife tells me I've got five. Let's go. All right, so he says don't bow down to them. Don't make images. Don't, don't confuse your idea of who I am with who I am. We'll move on. We've got to go on. Second thing, second jewel in the crown is you will not make the, the shem, the presence manifested by attributes of a holy one, your God, empty of meaning or an object of ridicule. Uh, you, you won't, in English, we also read this as thou shalt not uh, take up, take the holy one, the name of the holy one in vain, the name of God in vain finite English, Western mindset, this is a commandment. No, this is something more than that. This is energy from heaven. No, what it means is you're going to be able to bring honor and glory to my presence and my persona. You will not dilute it with your own nonsense, your own garbage, your own ideas, your own ideologies, your own political positions, your own theories. You won't do that. I'm going to empower you from heaven to be able to stay focused on my character, my attributes, my persona. If one thing we need to learn is Shem is not about a name, it's in English. Shem is about presence manifested by attributes and characteristics. It's not pronunciation of vowels. <laughs> it is not that. Shem in Hebrew, this word that we translate as name in English, is about the very presence. It's one of the words that's used for the presence. As a matter of fact, he says, I will, I will, uh, the, all those places I will cause my, I will place my name. I will place my Shem. He's not talking about putting a bunch of vowels and consonants together. When he places his shem, he means that's when he dwells with his abiding characteristics and attributes. It's like shekinah in another Hebrew word. The idea of bringing the presence down to you by manifesting his attributes and so on. So we'll, we'll take, we'll steward that presence. We'll steward his attributes, his character, and not subject them to ridicule, make them vain or, non, or meaningless to the world or somehow in disrepute to the world. In the flesh, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I've done it so many times. And if you don't, you're just not thinking clearly. <laughs> when you got all ad up, uh, up in your attitude, you're all up in your emotions and up in your, up in your beliefs and up in your partisanship and up in your ideology, and you got all up in that and you got all huffy and tuffy and arrogant, that you did every time you did that, you as a child of the king, a one who's yacht side by the king, has just proven you are not in the flesh capable of carrying this great glory, this great honor. But he says, oh, that's not what you're limited. You're not limited to the limitations of the flesh. That's Yitro's thought process. This is not about your commandment in the flesh. We're going to empower you to be able to do this more and more as you go. Third one. I'm run out of time. Third one. Uh, you will remember and commemorate the Shabbat for its holiness. This is one of the jewels in your crown. This is one of the jewels in that 
that you will learn to take the energy of the holiness of the Sabbath. You see, this Sabbath is like a portal of energy. 24 hours, as earth time as we count it, but it is something much more than that. It's not about just a day you get to chill out and rest and do what you want to do. This is a day in which we are actually to focus our energy on receiving. Turn our receiver up. Tune in as tight as we possibly can to the frequency and draw all the energy of the heavens we possibly can. This is how we get our energy. This is how we get our holiness. Why do we remember the holiness? Why do we remember the Shabbat? Why do we commemorate it, bring it to the forefront of our minds? Why do we do these things? He says, because of its holiness. <laughs> the holiness, the Kedusha, the energy of heaven in it. You do it for that. You need the energy. You're Pac-Man, and this is your energy pill. Come, take your Shabbat to, to receive it. And in doing so, it, it's so much more than that. It becomes now the, the marriage, the wedding ring. That proves to everybody else that you are drawing that energy from. You are married to him. You are covenant in covenant with him. You're in breed with him. You're on his pathway. His pathway has these Sabbaths in it. So he says, remember the Holy One. Remember and commemorate the Shabbat for its holiness. Six days labor and accomplish all your mundane creative tasks. Seventh day, cease unto the Holy One. He goes on to talk about that. The next one. We are to model honor. You will model, you will honor your father and mother. You will. This is a prophetic declaration. This is an energy pulsing from heaven. You will honor your father and mother. Now, this is in the spiritual realm, because in the natural realm, you're going to want to fight your father and mother at every turn, especially after a certain age. You're going to want to resist your father and mother. You're going to want to judge them. You're going to want to think you're smarter than they are. You're going to think they're more, you're more intelligent. You're going to think you're, you're, you're more spiritual. You're going to think you're more in tune. You're, you're more cool than, than they are. You're going to think all those things, and you're going to actually res resent some of the things they've done, some of the things they've said, some of the ways they have behaved. You're going to resent them for that. You see, that's in the flesh. In the natural, though, your purpose is to bring them honor. Your purpose is to be so full of the energy of God that people say, whose kid is that? <laughs> whose child is that? What a parent, what a, what, a, what a person that must have been to be able to raise a child with that level of divine energy flowing in them. You see, it has nothing whatsoever to do with whether you think they deserve to be honored or not. Get that out of your head. This has nothing to do with whether you think they're right about everything. Whether they, this issue is God chose them to be the one who gave you life. They may be the worst piece of trash you know. Hopefully not, but they may. One of them may. Both of them may. How else are they going to get honored if you don't do it? <laughs> You're the seed through which they're to be honored. This is the challenge of the, of the kingdom. This is the pillars of the kingdom. We will say, okay, what does it take to bring honor to even dishonorable parents? What behavior on my part? What ways of interacting with the world on my part will it take? He will give you the energy to do, be able to do that. We are to Loterzak, uh, English, we're going to read, Thou shalt not kill. Oh, I, I, I love the way English categorizes things and brought, breaks them into little bites and pieces and takes all the substance out of them. This is like seeing yellow in the rainbow. <laughs> not just, not canary yellow, not, 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 not orange yellow, not the, all the different shades and variations. You just see the yellow in the, in the rainbow. This is, don't kill. Okay, don't kill. Right, don't kill. That's a good idea. Not killing people is a good idea. But what did Yeshua say? This is a lot more about not killing, right? This is, this is so deep. There are so many variations, so many frequencies of this you shall not turn sock, which is to strike and to tear apart. You are not to be a destroyer. You're not to be a, a one who tears things apart. You're not supposed to be dissecting things. You're not supposed to be finding fault and, and segregating and characterizing and, and breaking things up and, and trying to destroy, dissolve. You are not to be that. You will not be that. The energy of heaven is not for that. <laughs> the energy of heaven, the wholeness energy of heaven comes into you in order that you can make things whole, not make them things divided, not break them up into fragments and pieces, not to kill, not to, but not to do anything that would harm. You know, the, the, the Hippocratic Oath has this famous say, I will do no harm. 
That's the way they phrase it. I will bring healing. We are called to bring these sources of wholeness and wellness into our world. That's what this energy is. This next one says, and in English, we read, I will not commit adultery, or you will not, thou shalt not commit adultery. Again, I just shake my head. <laughs> this is the way we have chosen to interpret this in English. As opposed to the, the concept of saying, the Holy One is energizing us to where we will not mix, admix, adulterate the, the thing that we are created to be by mixing with things that we are not supposed to mix with. We'll have discernment to be able to understand we just are not supposed to connect with that. It's in, not just in this physical, sexual realm. That's one obvious area. This is about every thought, areas of thought, philosophy, ideology, politics. I, I'm not, I've got a crown I've got to carry. I've got a crown with nine jewels. I don't have time to do that. That would be an adulteration for me to get caught up in that stuff. It's not that I'm better than that. It's just that the yitros need to care, take care of those issues. And I need to take care of the holiness infusion, infusion into the world. So this, uh, low tenaf. The next one is, you, uh, low tignav. And again, in English, it's translated down as the lowest common denominator, the smallest level of impact it could possibly have. And it says, thou shalt not steal. And you shouldn't. Okay, that's, that's, a, no, that's a given, right? That's common sense. That doesn't take divine energy. It's just common sense. You shouldn't steal. Now, what does lo tignov mean? <laughs> lo tignov means that you will recognize that the creator of the universe has distributed everything according to his plan. It's not your job to redistribute it. It's not your job to want something or take something that is in somebody else's possession. You say, they don't deserve it. He said, wait. <laughs> Give it a generation. I've got, I'm looking generationally, cross-generationally. Let me put things in people's hands in people's possessions, in people's usages. Let me do it and quit arguing over whether it's right or wrong or they should have it or they shouldn't have it. Quit worrying about what Bezos has or what, uh, how much money Gates has or how much property. Quit worrying about that. That is not your business. Lo tigna. Stay with what I give you. Use what I give you. Use what I put in your possession. And let everybody else keep that which is in their possession. And don't judge them for it. Lo tigna. You will lo ta'ane veri eka ed shacher. You were not to, in English, thou shalt not bear false witness. Yeah, again, common sense. You shouldn't lie under oath. You shouldn't. You shouldn't make very false testimony. Now, what does it mean, though? Don't say anything that's going to mislead or deceive or cover anything of the truths of the Holy One, the energy for which we're supposed to release. Don't live or speak inconsistently with the plan of God and what he's doing in your world, in your life. Don't do that by distraction, but talk about other stuff. Stay focused on what he has said to do and do it. And finally, the tenth. Lo takmod, in English, thou shalt not covet. Fascinating. It goes to motivation. It goes to your, your self-talk. What you'll desire. He's, he's really getting intense here. I will so energize you, is what he's saying. I will so energize you with the holiness of heaven that you will not even desire or think about or focus on desiring for yourself anything that I have put in the hands of somebody else. Not only will you not take it, we not interfere with or judge their possession of it, you won't even desire it for yourself. You, it won't even be an issue to you. If the rich get richer and the poor get poor, it won't be an issue to you if the 99% have less than the 1%. It won't be an issue to you if somebody makes a higher salary than you do for the same work that you do. And it's unfair and it's unjust. You will not worry to you if there's a glass ceiling where you live and when you live right now. And you can't break that glass ceiling because of your gender, your age, your sexuality, or whatever it may be, you will quit worrying about stuff like that because you see the energy of heaven says you will flourish where I put you. And any situation I give you, I will energize you, divinely energize you to bear fruit. Isn't it amazing how it changes the entire perspective when we see this is what the Holy One has done for us? Well, I, I, could, I, I it could go on, but I see the time and I realize what, limitations of time we have with regard to the internet so I, i'm going to basically kind of wrap this up with a, a kind of a summary uh and tell you what happened 
This was way too heavy <laughs> for the mindset of a people who just came out of slavery. The people who had watched other cultures do well while they struggled, watched unfairness and justice, uh, watched uh, fraud and deception being practiced on a great scale, uh, watched oppression take place they had just come out of that and they were so shell-shocked and so uh, traumatized by it that when they heard this brilliant wisdom this this divine energy coming forth from heaven it was way too much and so they they trembled which we still should I hope you're still trembling I hope you've heard what I've said today and it's gone deep into your spirit and you begin to tremble inside your spirit that the voice of the Holy One has this idea for you that you had no clue was that deep, was that heavy, was that powerful. He has this crown for you that is a glorious crown that you need to wear, your crown of, of nine jewels. That is to transform every encounter you have, every interaction you have. You had no idea, so you should be a little overwhelmed by now. You should be trembling inside. You should be uh, stirred with passion, with power, but... Understand your mind can't even uh, wrap itself around it. <laughs> your mind can't wrap yourself around what even Bill Bullock and his, his silliness of lack of vocabulary would, tried to explain to you today about who you are and why you're here and what your calling is and what your impact in the world is supposed to be. You can't understand. It. So you'll, you'll tremble, and they, and they stood afar off. And they said to Moshe, we can't, do, we can't hear it. We can't even listen to it anymore. We can't listen to what the Holy One, we can't draw any more energy. We've, we've axed out on energy, divine energy, holiness energy from heaven. You go. You just do the exact opposite of what Yitro counseled the camp to do. I love it. Yitro said, no, you don't need to do all this stuff. You need to have other people do all this stuff. You need to break them into groups of tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands and have all these different leaders and have this hierarchy of leadership to go to it and so now the holy one speaks and it's so powerful so moving so grand and glorious in its impact they say we can't handle this motion <laughs> moses you you go and talk to him you begin to explain it to us little bit by little bit these are the ten pillars we can't even fathom the ten pillars but what's going to hang on those pillars what are the things that are going to be fill out the gaps, fill out the blanks, the rest of the rainbow that Alita can see, that most human beings can't see? What's the rest of the rainbow? Moshe, I don't think we can handle hearing the voice directly anymore. You, one person, one person, not groups of tens and groups of fifties and groups of hundreds and groups of thousands, not leaders of this hierarchy and that hierarchy. Moshe, you go and you listen to what he has to say and you come back and you teach us line by line. What hangs on these ten pillars? What does the rest of the kingdom look like in practical reality? What is going to be to carry the energy and to actually host the presence of the creator of the universe? Wow, what is it going to take? Moshe, you go and you hear it and you come back and tell us and we will do what you say. Whatever you say, we will do. Now, that's a bold statement they aren't always able to fulfill. Most of us are the same way. But here's the idea. Can we draw the energy of the Holy One? So as we get ready to finish with all my friends from across the world, I uh, bless you and thank you for coming. I, I know that we have, uh, this is the greatest hits of the greatest hits. And so we're in utero. And uh, some of the things I've said are very powerful, uh, but they're spiritual. They're not necessarily going to make your mind feel better. They'll, they'll make your spirit feel really good. If you listen to it over and over again, perhaps it may help. In the meantime, if you have a, a comment, if you have a criticism, a question, an issue, if you have something uh, that you want to talk about or if you have something you want us to pray about, please put your name down in the place where you're viewing from. It always is good to see where you're from. I, I've, I've met all my new friends from the, uh, the, the Far East, uh, the Philippines and Malaysia and, and Australia and New Zealand and uh, uh, then in, in South Africa and Zimbabwe and and uh, up in uh, the UAE, the United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, of course, all into Israel and through, throughout the, the Europe and, and all of the Americas. It's so good to hear from you wherever you are. Be, may you be blessed. May you have a wonderful Shabbat. But most of all, may you tune 
to the frequency of the beautiful voice of the creator of the universe. Tune out all of the voices. And may you so cherish and treasure the way of the covenant that he set forth to you that none of the things that the affect the rest of the world, that destroy their peace, that take away their joy, that take away their hope, take away their testimony of life, none of those things will be able to impact you, affect you, or stop you. Amen. Shabbat shalom. See you next week.